Hi, I'm Itu, and this is a devlog for Sand Horizons. Today we'll talk about a key element of the game that I've just finished, visuals. If you watched the first entry, you might remember that the initial game made in a jam looked like this. One of Sand Horizons' goal was to make it prettier. As you can guess, it was not a small task. One Code of a Grid, the ancestor of Sand Horizons, is a 2D game with a minimalist UI. Its central cross comes in response to a recurring issue I have with rhythm games. In most games like Guitar Hero or Stepmania, beats are sliding on a single lane. They can be identified by their color, shape and position. And while the left and right are easy to grasp, left is on the left and right on the right, for up and down, it's trickier. Yeah, they are indicated by the arrow direction, but in the heat of the action right now, can you easily tell which is which? It's not really intuitive, and personally, I find it hard to read. It requires a cognitive effort to read the note and associate it to the key. It's only after having played for a while that we begin to get used and can recognize them instinctively. But this isn't what I look for in a rhythm game. I don't want a challenge based on the reading of the screen, I want something that requires to focus on the music rhythm. And for that, visuals, if they are necessary, must be immediately intuitive. The brain shouldn't even have the time to wonder what buttons must be pressed, it must just know it as soon as it sees it, so that it can concentrate on timing. This is why I made this cross design, it can be read immediately. What comes from the left is for the left button, right for the right, up is up and down is down. Easy to get, you barely need time to adapt. It's like if I were throwing a ball at you. You don't need to think, you just instinctively know where to place your hand to catch it. This allows to really focus on the rhythmic aspect of the game without the understanding of the screen getting in the way. Therefore, this is a design that I wanted to keep in Sound Horizons. Another main inspiration was the Beat Trip Saga, a series of rhythm games that came out around 2010. On top of being minimalist and challenging in their design, these games have all in common a progression system that inspired the design of One Call of a Grid. When the player increases their score, they also fill a bar that allows them to upgrade their level. They start in Hyper, then goes to Mega, then Extra, Giga, and finally Meta. These levels are also used as health. If the player makes mistake, they go back down to the previous level, and if they reach the bottom, it's game over. It's a really efficient reinforcement loop, because it visibly rewards the player when they play well and creates a tension to make them keep their current level so that they can upgrade to the next one. On top of that, each of these layers will change the level's music and look. It does become thrilling to get to a new level and see everything around you becoming even more epic. As I said, I took inspiration from this game design for One Code of a Grid. The progression is made by scoring, and the player goes through layers that change the game's appearance. On top of all the benefits that I mentioned, there's another neat effect. The player doesn't need a UI to know where they are in the level. The music and background colors serve as landmark. First grey, then blue, green, red, and finally the ethereal white for the end. It's thus also an aspect I wanted to have in Sound Horizons, a level that visually evolves by radically changing color on each layer. From there, what can we do? How can we change this UI into something interesting? The main issue of One Color for Grid is that its visuals are way too static. There's barely any animation, we don't feel the music part of the game. For it to really be a rhythm game, it needs a scenery that dance, where everything is connected to the music and where we can feel the impact of the notes made by the player. To obtain this, there are two possibilities. Either we stay in 2D, and in this case we make something more polished, maybe by slightly shifting the camera to create a fake perspective, like in Hyper Hexagon, so that we break the monotony of the symmetry, or we try to make it in 3D, and there we have to ask ourselves the question, is it possible to transpose this cross design into 3D? At first, I wasn't sure how, but then I played the hard mode of One Call of a Grid, where the notes speed up when they are coming, and I realized that it kinda looks like a perspective, as if the notes were coming from afar, and they appear to go quicker when they become close. From there, I thought about a design using a tunnel, where instead of coming from the sides of the screen, the notes would come from the far away front and would move towards the player. This way the player can focus on the center of the screen without worrying too much about their peripheral vision. That was an idea with potential, but then how would that tunnel would look like? This is where my second aspiration came into play, panoramical. 
Panoramical is a musical game that heavily influenced OA design games. It's a game purely about music, where funds come just from the joy of making music. What is interesting here is its environment that dynamically reacts to the music and reshapes themselves along with it. It forms a symbiosis between visual and sound, providing a real sensation of synesthesia. And this is exactly the kind of emotion I want the player to feel in Sound Horizons. If we make the tunnel edges invisible, we could have a setting around it that move along the music and change on each layer. That would be perfect to give each layer its own identity and would create visuals that emerge players in the music. Alright, but one could still point out that we started from a 2D game with simple graphics, a perfect scope for a small rhythm game, and suddenly now we are talking about ambitious 3D environments that must be animated with the music and change their shape through the level. It's true, it's not making development easier, but it has notable perks. First, it allows the game to have enticing visuals. That was a big flow in one cut of a grid. If I can show some pretty 3D scenes for this game, that should attract more players. But most importantly, we need to take into consideration the possibility of making several levels. With the layer system, we know that a single level will change its color during the game. So we can just use colors to identify levels. They need a strong visual identity so that they can be recognized. And something I would like, if I have the occasion to make it into a larger game, is to work with artists. If I can let them express their creativity in each level by making each time unique landscapes, it would be pretty neat. Not only would this make the project more interesting for artists, it would also give to the game a lot of variety in its visuals. So in the long run, it's a possibility that I want to explore. But for now I don't have any artists, I'm all alone and I'm facing a big problem. I'm terrible at drawing, even worse at modeling. How will I be able to make those 3D graphics? Well, don't worry, I've got some tricks. Since Panoramical is my main aesthetic reference, I went with abstract landscape in low poly. Let's be honest, this already makes things simpler. No need for complex models, just big triangles with flattened colors. I also borrowed the scrolling towards the horizons. It goes nicely with the scrolling of the notes themselves, kinda like we're moving forward inside the music track. And in order to have infinite scrolling, we need procedural generation. What's nice with procedural generation is that I don't have to create models myself. I just let mathematics do all the work. Mathematics are pretty good for generating interesting stuff. The first task was to create low poly mountains. For this, I mostly took inspiration from a tutorial video as well as an article that also used it as a base. I'll spare you the technical details. If you want to know more, you can read the devlog entry I wrote on each IO. The solution can be mostly summarized by these three steps. Generate a low poly plane, by that I mean with triangle faces, generate a noise and use it to set the heights of the vertex, and finally use that same noise to apply colors by following a gradient. Thanks to this solution, I could build tools that allowed me to edit the terrain directly from the editor. From there, I tried several configurations by randomly adjusting the different parameters until I obtained satisfying mountain shapes. But I also had to apply some changes in the logic. First, I had to manage the infinite scrolling. That means generating several chunks that succeed to one another by shifting their coordinate on the noise. It's a classic trick. We have two scrolling meshes, and when one gets out of the screen, we delete it and we create a new one on the other side. The player didn't suspect a thing, mischief managed. But that also means that the first step, the generation of the plane, can't be completely random. To make sure that the chunks are fitting with each other, their size must share the same vertex. Otherwise, we get cut like this one. Thus, I had to slightly adjust the code to take this into account. If you've been watching carefully, you might have noticed that it's not perfect yet. But most of the time, it does the job. Secondly, for the noise generation, I wasn't really satisfied with results obtained from a pearl of noise. Okay, so about noise. If you don't know what it is, for once I'm not talking about sound, it's a kind of mathematics function that generates a texture in grey tones. And it can be used for a lot of things, namely ice on a 3D plane. Black represents the lowest point and white the highest one. It's really great to generate mountains or isles. Pearl and noise is one of those functions, maybe the most popular one, but it's not the only one. And among the alternatives, there is Voronoi noise or cellular noise that generates this kind of cells. 
Applied to heights, I find that it gives really cool results. It creates mountains with more natural shapes with chains and valleys. So I used the library that allowed me to generate more complex noises. I started from a Voronoi noise, then mixed it with a Perlin noise to add some roughness. After fiddling long enough, I eventually reached a result I'm really happy with. And what really makes this solution satisfying is that it allows me to update the height scale at runtime, allowing me to make this really neat transition between layer 1 and 2. It's an animation I deeply wanted in the game. However, there's an issue that might come back kick me in the future. Everything that I've described until now, the three steps I mentioned, are handled by scripts, meaning that it's computed by the CPU. And while I don't really have a choice for the first step, and it's only done on the chunk creation anyway, for the two others, as soon as there are animations, it becomes quite consuming. So if the game turns out to have performance issues, I might have to re-implement these so that they use the GPU instead. And for this, I could use my new toy. Shaders are scary. At least that's the impression I had before starting this project. I had used them for another game before, and it was a bit painful. I barely understood what I was doing, the script logic was completely beyond me. Let's face it, learning shaders is very dull on the start. Alright, it's a function that will determine the color of each pixel, oh, sorry, I mean each fragment, it takes UV coordinate, color is a vector 3, and after completing the first series of tutorial, you end up being able to draw a red circle. The path to all making interesting stuff seem infinitely long. Shader logic is mostly mathematics that are hard to visualize. You tinker without knowing what you're doing, it's easy to lose your motivation. However, Unity provides a tool that changes that. Shader Graph. It's a nodal editor allowing to create shaders with our UI. And it's pretty intuitive. Because you instantly see what you're doing, so you can experiment, try random combination, and feel like you have control on your creation. The bases are not hard to get, and it's easy to test the numerous tools provided to see what they're doing. Also, there are plenty of tutorials on the web for more advanced effects. Usually, I'm not really fond of tutorials, but here I found that it was a really efficient way to learn. I will take inspiration from one or several videos, use them as a base template, and then try to add my own variation and mix them with other techniques. In the end, thanks to Shader Graph, shaders finally clicked with me. It makes creating them really accessible, and even fun actually. There was a period where I was just making random shaders, not knowing how I would use them, I was just trying to get cool results. This is how I made by pure accident these clouds here, and also this kind of floating bubbles in the sky. With once again the best ally of procedural, Pearl and Noise. It's really a fantastic tool for shaders, it allows to create a lot of cool effects with already a rich random texture. But shaders are not only for texturing, it can also do mesh transformations, like those spheres on which I added an undulation so that they look liquid. What's also nice with shaders is that they are easy to animate. As long as they have input parameters, you can transform them in complex way just by progressively changing their values. And guess what? There's a lot of animations in Sound Horizons. In order to make the world look more alive, it needs to be animated. I already used animations for transitions between two layers, cause you can brutally switch from one to another, it needs to transition smoothly. For this, I mostly use Twins, animation tools that progressively update properties from one value to another in a given duration. I even coded a utility component that allows me to configure Twins on shaders. This way I don't even have to open the code, I just configure the start and final state, and the Twin handles the values interpolation, with is in and is out. From an aesthetic perspective, I wanted to suggest some kind of natural evolution of the world along the player's progression. First the terrain is flat, then mountains rise, then it starts raining and the water level goes up, then the nights fall and some kind of light drops emerge from the earth. It's still very abstract, evoking kind of a natural cycle on a distant planet. The animation plays also a second role, synchronizing the world with the music. Without it, the scenery is just a background. Pretty, sure, but it's not part of the game. There are different ways to animate it with music. I chose to only react to the game's dynamic instruments, when notes appear and when the player hits them. Combined with the audio, this makes for stronger games feedback. The actions are really boosted and you feel better the impact of the music you're playing.
as I said in the beginning, I have now implemented every environment and all of the animations. It's a task that took me 5 months, and given my level, I'm rather proud of the result. The neat detail in all of this is that the game uses zero assets. Well, okay, that's not actually correct, there is one texture used for the background. But besides this, it's just shaders and procedural. The only 3D models you'll find are spheres, cylinders and planes. That makes a really abstract world, but still with beautiful landscapes. This is one of the best looking game I've ever made. I hope it will be enough this time to make people want to play it. And now that this part is done, it means that I can go back working on the game itself. Next time, we'll tackle the end of the level, which will include a new special challenge. Feel free to subscribe if you want to get updated when it arrives. Thank you very much for watching and see you next time.